and I were just reminiscing before this, uh, the last time, a crew of about 20 people over here, the last time my crew and I were all here at Studio Paris uh, was New Year's Eve about a couple years back, and we were aimlessly dancing on these tables here. Um, and now, I'm giving a fucking speech. So, it's, it's crazy to think that with my injury, I probably can't dance like I once could. Um, but to be honest, it's probably for the better. Uh, for um, so I have an injury to thank for that, really. Um, with that, I'll go right into my speech. Um, my name is Cameron Zick. I'm an RIC patient. Uh, and I had a, uh, a story to share with you, and I'll jump right into it, um, that starts about a year ago today, actually. Um, and uh, there'll be video shortly once I get to it that will help paint a clear picture of my recovery at RIC. Um, but first, I wanted to start at the vacation to give you a sense of how I got here. On May 23rd, 2015, uh, five friends from Northwestern and I were in Colorado, Ridgeway, Colorado, um, on a vacation on a hiking trip. My hiking trip ended when I slipped and fell off a rock head first into the snow. Uh, and we were 11,000 feet atop a mountain. I immediately lost all functionality and movement in my arms and my legs. I lost all sensation, uh, and I realized I had broken my neck and was paralyzed from the neck down. The next 12 hour journey to get down from the mountain was a physical and mental experience that's really difficult for me to explain, but what I do know is that everything was executed to perfection to keep my neck intact that day. So immediately following the accident, it was around 3 p.m., uh, two of my friends sprinted down the mountain to find rescue and cell service. Uh, three of my friends stayed with me uh, for stabilizing my neck, immobilizing my spine, uh, ensuring mental stability. At that point around 3 p.m., we knew that an incumbent snowstorm was about to hit, so 12-inch snowstorm hit, nightfall came, uh, and temperatures dipped below 30. The three friends who stayed with me on this mountain, as I said, were stabilizing my neck, but also were miraculous in that they brought heated tinfoil blankets and inflatable air mattress. They proceeded to put me underneath a tree for safety and to protect me from incoming snow. At that point, it was about six hours of waiting on the mountain in hope of rescue without any sign that rescue was coming. Uh, that my friends were helping me calm down the nerves of screaming at my body and my body not moving like it used to. From there, six hours later, a rescue team of 10 mountain men showed up. Um, nine mountain men, the first one on, uh, first one that responded was Ruth. She was like a G.I. Jane from Demi Moore. Uh, I fucking love her, she's the best. Uh, she was the first on the scene, which I was very grateful for. Um, and those six uh, mountain rescue teams showed up, immediately told me that we couldn't land a helicopter to airlift me out because of the incoming snowstorm, and instead that they would have to package me up in an insulated coffin-like body bag and carry me down the mountain uh, through the snowstorm. So at that point, uh, I had a little eye patch where I could kind of see and hear things that were, were going on, but the six hour trek down the mountain was a psychological roller coaster, um, unlike any other, really. So with that psychological roller coaster in mind, you think about a lot of thoughts in this situation. Um, first thing that comes to mind is like, why me? Uh, what could I have done differently on that rock? And to me, I was able to erase that mentality really quickly because I realized that had no impact on my recovery or me re making it down from the rock. Couldn't change anything that happened there. The next wave of thoughts that came through my head were, what if I don't make it down from this mountain? What if we get lost? What if they drop me? What if I, uh, my body gives out? And then the third question was, what in life is worth living for if I am paralyzed? So the first two questions that came to my mind, my response, and I kept reminding myself was, at the time, I'm 25 years old, um, there's so much in life to learn, to love, to experience, to accomplish. My life doesn't end by falling in a three foot pile of fucking snow. Like that's just like not what my life was scripted to do. I kept reminding myself, there's so much more left to do. Um, 
The third question is the one I had the most difficulty with. And at that point, I started to look at what are the people, the places, the things, the experiences that I want to enjoy and want to live for and make it down to this mountain to do. Um, the first, for example, that would come to my mind is I have a six-year-old sister. And I had this visualization of playing baseball with her um, in an open field and teaching her how to play baseball. Just wanted to do that one more time. Um, so what I was doing for those six hours was almost daydreaming to take myself out of the nightmare that I was experiencing. Um, and it's funny because I tell my family and friends that I was daydreaming about, you guys were helping me along this journey before you even knew about it. From there, I basically kept reiterating to my, my friends and the rescue team, if you just get me down the mountain and into a warm bed, and into rehab, I'll take it from there. We got, 12 hours later, we got down the mountain into an ambulance that took me into surgery, uh, and the diagnosis was an incomplete spinal cord injury, incomplete quadriplegic, uh, with a broken uh, burst C6 fracture in my neck, and a compressed C5 and C7. Uh, my doctor's original prognosis for my recovery was you might be lucky to walk again in a year, um, and you'll be uh, very fortunate to get on your feet and get back to work and live on your own independently in about two to three years. But to be honest, when I got that prognosis, I was excited. Like, I was actually thrilled because I was excited, A, to get into a warm bed and into rehab, uh, B, because there was this idea that I never saw light, that I never think I'd see light again. Um, and then three, there's just this idea that all those experiences, the people, the places that I was dreaming about, I had a chance to actually do what I needed to do to experience those again. So I worked my ass off in rehab and I was just excited to get going. Um, from there, I was, in, uh, I was in Colorado when injury happened, so it was about two weeks in Colorado. Um, and I had the decision of where do I want to rehab. Uh, I looked at San Diego, that's where I'm from. Uh, I looked back to Chicago, that's where I have friends, family, or not family, friends, and family at work. I work at Uber, so I have a family and community there. Um, so I looked at both of these situations and what would be best for me. And the first thing that came to mind was, I can't do this research on my own. I couldn't physically use my hands. I couldn't physically actually make a decision on my own. So I have, my special thank you goes out to my mom, my dad, an immediate crew of friends and family who took it upon themselves to help me make that decision. So it's funny, I, I love my banker and consultant type A friends. Because <laughs> no questions asked, they immediately pulled together a quantitative and qualitative assessment <laughs> of the top three rehab centers in all 10 of our top markets. It was the most crucial thing I've ever seen in my life. Sell spreadsheet, like every point of data you can actually imagine. I think they actually outsourced some of it to you. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually absolutely amazing. He's admitting to it. Um, they pulled this together for me and I was just like overwhelmed with joy that I, because I, that was information I couldn't see from my own. Uh, and from there, from that information, we were delineating, okay, here are the best rehab options for us. And my family and those friends immediately jumped on the phone, made calls to all the rehab centers, connected with everybody in the medical field that they knew for inside information. Um, that's not bad, but like more like just like knowing about the medical community. Uh, and were working tirelessly with insurance and air ambulance jets to get me out of Chicago, out of Colorado. An incredibly selfless act. And there was a sense of, I felt really helpless that I couldn't use my hands. And I was so in awe by the all hands on decks approach that they had with no questions asked. Um, so from there, it became pretty clear uh, with that itself, especially uh, that RIC was the number one choice uh, for where I wanted to go for rehab. Um, number one in what they do in Spinal for Research in the last 25 years, incredibly diverse rehab options. Um, some of the best teams are in RIC, and I'm grateful also to be, a, I was connected ahead of time to an RIC member, and I had to talk to them. Um, and I spoke with them, and I said, I really want to get my ass kicked in rehab. I want someone who's going to kick me up, kick my ass, and put me in the shape. And they're like, okay, we got someone for you. They put me on the phone, and it was the, uh, the head of the red, uh, wheelchair rugby team. And she was basically like, I'm not gonna take no for an answer. Um, as in like, uh, 
you have no choice of, of really coming here. I want to work with you. Um, and with that, I think, before I jump into um, what RIC actually, like what I enjoyed about RIC, uh, I will tell you that on the back here, there's gonna be videos that sort of uh, paint a clearer picture of my career at RIC that you'll be able to see. Um, but with that mentality of no came, I realized that RIC, my favorite thing was I never heard the answer no. Basically, no one ever told me no. No one ever said, um, no, you can't do this. No, your recovery won't be like this. Or no, you'll never be able to walk again. Sadly, that's not the norm. I've talked to a number of different patients who have medical professionals tell them, this is your diagnosis, this is your future. You can't do, get back and do the things that you passionately love. Um, that isn't the case at RIC, and it's, that's an incredibly unfair prognosis as well, because when you think about it, an incomplete spinal cord injury, there's no textbook on it. You can't, there's nothing that says if you do A plus B plus C times 16 months, you'll get X percent recovery. That just straight up doesn't exist. So it's incredibly unfair for these doctors to be telling these people, and at RIC, they align with that idea that you can have an anomaly-like prognosis. And I really, truly appreciated that from my experience with them. So by the time I got to RIC, uh, I'm thankful that they aligned on these goals to exceed this expectation. I laid them out in the very beginning. Uh, they didn't scoff when I said, I want to get my basics back. When I was in a wheelchair and couldn't use my arms, I said, of course, I'm going to be able to get my basics back. Uh, they said, how soon do you want to go? And I said, my ultimate goal for my recovery is to climb that same mountain and stand on that same rock again. Um, almost like a full circle-like goal and a personal, like, fuck you to the rock. <laughs> So with that, when I arrived at RIC, I felt safe, and I seized control of my accident and channeled it into my recovery. By day two at RIC, um, 19 days after my surgery and my accident, uh, I took my first steps with a walker right here um, on my own uh, with a RIC cancer. Yeah. So my first steps with water, albeit it was 60 feet in six minutes and I needed about eight rest breaks in a wheelchair, but it was progress, it was walking. Um, about seven weeks later, I took my first steps without any use of an assistive device. In July, I got into RIC in about early June, in mid-July, um, I finally finished my inpatient rehab months ahead of the uh, projected schedule um, and began, uh, I left standing on my own two feet using a walker and cane um, within two months after my accident. So for the last 10 months, uh, I've been committed to about 20 to 30 hours of rehab since an outpatient. And what I mean by that is I do PT and OT assigned by RIC, and I've added a bunch of other modalities to help complete my recovery, uh, including yoga, acupuncture, tai chi, uh, learning how to swim, uh, swim exercise, uh, gyrotonic Pilates, um, a number of other different methods, myofascial release, electrical stimulations, all these things help complete this recovery to get to where I am today. Um, and every one of those modalities, which I loved, aligned with the goals that I had set with RIC previously. So since moving into outpatient therapy um, from July 2015 to now, uh, my RIC and I are doing everything I really can to reclaim my life with it. So for example, in July, I moved into an apartment and started living on my own which is really in and of itself. In August, uh, I basically took my, um, no, sorry, it was in October, I jogged for the first time on a treadmill on a harness. In November, uh, I did push-ups, albeit they're like half push-ups, and there's seven of them, but they're push-ups. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Woo! In November, RIC has an amazing fundraiser that you should get a chance to go to. We climbed the, uh, the Willis Tower. It's about 103 floors, and I completed that in November. Um, wow. Woo! With, uh, with the help and support of all my best friends, we almost looked at it as like a practice for reclimbing the mountain, uh, and we all did it together then. In December, I basically started uh, learning how to swim on my own. 
And in February, um, which isn't here yet, and you'll see it soon, uh, I completed a box jump of 25 inches. And then as of April and today, I started running outside without a harness, no assistive devices on my own, uh, and started jump roping for the first time last week. What I was accomplishing in days and weeks, my doctors and therapists at RIC said they would have hoped to have seen for me in months. Um, I'm beyond grateful that my body has responded to the rehab that I put forth um, and that my team has worked effortlessly in. I think there's a lot to do in what I want to do to complete my recovery, but I have the utmost faith in my RIC team that we will complete the recovery we've been looking for since the very beginning. Before I finish, I'd like to just share a couple key three things, uh, key three learnings that I've learned throughout this uh, transformative journey um, with RIC and with a spinal cord injury that you can hopefully take home with you. Um, the three learnings that I'd love to share with you today are acceptance of failure as progression, fall in love with the process of being great, and you can't do this alone. When I say acceptance of failure is progression, to bring you into a spinal cord injury a little bit, at the start, I actively thought about moving my hands and my legs, thinking about it and not seeing a move. It's incredibly discouraging. It's incredibly frustrating. It's, your body is silent when your mind is racing. It's an incredibly scary situation. So at that point, what I'm incredibly grateful for as well is my RAC team, I looked at them and said, I can't fix a car without knowing how the parts work. Please teach me about my body. Teach me about a spinal cord injury. I need to understand how my mind and my body is supposed to connect. And my RAC doctors and therapists and residents, residents were bringing in their med school clerks, my doctors and therapists were continually teaching me along the way of how I'm supposed to connect my mind and my body. One of the first things that I realized and that like, I'm grateful for through this process is Failure to physically move your body with a spinal cord injury or getting pushed by PTs to the point of failing, as in like to the point of falling, is actually progress. And what I mean by that is that as long as you relentlessly pair visualization with the intention to move, you're making progress. I learned with that as well that repetition is so key. When I repeatedly visualize doing something, for instance, like opening my hand and my hand doesn't open, it's actually a mental rep because I'm retraining the nerve pathways in my mind and my body to reconnect. So think of it as if there's a railroad, the railroad is cut in half, you need to build a new railroad track for your body to learn how to function and how to operate, and that's exactly what I was gonna do. So it's gonna take thousands and thousands of mental reps. And with a spinal cord injury, when you think about opening your hand, you don't see it, there's an opportunity to get dejected and not try again. So the acceptance of failure is progression is the idea of mental reps is actually progression with this injury. Fall in love with the process of being great. Or fall in love with the process of complete recovery in my eyes. I mean, it's a little bit cheesy, I know, but it's been a model of mine in 2016 because it's the idea that you can, if you passionately put focus and discipline into the rehab, and you understand that you can only control the things that are presently in front of you that day, you will make it to the goals that you end up, you can make it to the goals that you've had in mind the entire way. So like me waking up tomorrow morning and saying, my goal is to open my hands again, or my goal is to do this or that. It's not gonna happen unless I'm passionately focused on the day-to-day -day process, trust the rehab process that my team at RAC and I have put together to get there, and accept that each day is going to be a long journey to get to that goal. But with that, it, it can become discouraging when you're doing that and you don't see the results every single day. So something I learned is that you have to be able to identify and celebrate small victories. And what I mean for that, by that is by, by noticing small things that you've done differently, that you did a little bit better today than what you did the previous day, and that is almost, in a sense, an affirmation that you're on the right process. The process is working. Um, and the best way I think I've been able to do that thus far is this idea that, like, is with this injury, I have a, I can thank it because I have this really cool opportunity 
to enjoy what I like to call my first first again. And by first first, I mean none of us, we're all too young, we don't remember the first time we stood up, the first time we walked, the first time we ate a bite of food. All of these things we were too young to remember, we don't have that memory. And with this injury, I have this unique opportunity to remember and enjoy what it feels like to do these things again and actually keep those memories and cherish them. And in a way, I also have an opportunity to look forward to doing those memories again, and that's in a way motivation. I'm excited about the first, first time I will, I was gonna run. I'm excited about right now the first, first time uh, I'm gonna do like a, uh, a sprint. I'm excited about the first, first time I climb that mountain. I'm excited about the first, first time I drive. Um, all these things are just in a sense motivation um, within my rehab and within enjoying this transformative journey on the process. I look back and I remember that a lot of my first, first times were with RAC as well. Um, the first, first time I hugged my mom, uh, able to move my arms up and hug her. The first, first time I cooked a meal for my mom and my sister as an OT session. The first, first time uh, I was able to stand up, I was able to walk, I was able to do these things. Uh, I'm beyond grateful that I was able to share those opportunities with RIC. The last one is you can't do this alone. And what I mean by that is something my friends and I have, uh, my friends and my dad and I have constantly said, you're the composite of the five to 10 to 15 closest people you keep around you. As in you, you carry these traits that you keep and you keep a quality circle and a quality network around you. When you have this injury, and I hope that none of you guys ever realize this, but I can tell given the, the amount of people here and the, the, the amount of love that I can even see, is that you all have done an amazing job of surrounding yourself with quality people. But when you have this injury, something I hope none of you guys realize, that network comes into play. That network of support and love comes into play. You realize that not only do you surround yourself with 10 to 15, 20 quality people, but those 10 to 15 and 20 quality people have surrounded themselves with 10 to 15 and 20 quality people. And when this injury happened, I had friends, family, friends of friends, RIC patients, friends of friends of friends of friends, people unremoved that didn't even know me, reaching out and offering support, love, visiting me. It was an empowering feeling. It was a beautifully human thing to see that network in play. Um, it just stresses the importance of being aware and grateful for the 10 15, whoever it is, are just quality people that you keep around you. And I think with that, I'll end with a challenge that I have for each of you with those three girls in mind. The first one being, if we looked at the goals, it's uh, acceptance of failure is progression. Fall in love with the process of being great, and you can't do this alone. So I challenge you with your acceptance of failure is progression, as in what failures in your life what things have you fallen short of can you look at as progress? If I looked at the second one, fall in love with the process of being great, what process do you need to commit to to get back and achieve that said goal? And the third one being you can't do this alone, express gratitude to the people around you who are helping build you up and better yourself on your way to hopefully achieving those goals. And that's what I again want to do right now. So with that in mind, uh, something I try to do every day with gratitude is I would like to say thank you. Thank you to my family. Thank you to my friends. Thank you to my family at Google. Just as Jordan and Kate just said as well, thank you to you guys. Thank you to the donors. You don't understand the, the donations and the raffles, all that work that you guys have put, all the money they put into this for, for this fundraise, for this cause, is transforming the lives of others and letting them get have the opportunity to seek and strive for a complete recovery like mine. 
So because of that, on behalf of RAC, I really do want to thank you guys. And thank you for your time for letting me share my story on behalf of RAC. And cheers, cheers to dance on the table tonight.